want to pick. Thank you, Amber. Chris, can I pick on you, Chris Fitzgerald? Everybody else does, so have at it. I would love for you to answer that question, Chris. Just when did this feel real for you? Say the whole question again. When did COVID start feeling COVID real two years feel ago? Real yeah. for us? Um, well, I, I think, you know, I think back to those th this time two years ago when we were just, we were overwhelmed with information coming in and updates from the health department and whatnot. But, but once, once we were starting to read things that was, it was actually coming more from from this community here about what we should be doing with our with our shelters, what we should be doing with our animals, um, like that's that's where it felt you know it felt real. It wasn't something that was just happening out there in the world somewhere. This was you know we were preparing um, for you know for big changes and uh, and you know thankfully we didn't have to to deal with uh, a lot of the influx uh, of animals that was expected or the loss of of staff. But um, but it still felt it felt like it was a real thing happening in that moment because we were making real changes. Well, another good friend of mine that I got to meet during. COVID, Chris Fitzgerald. Chris, we're going to come to you in just one second. I know you like to give it a couple minutes uh, before we kick off the call. Just a really quick note, uh, Mary Smith is not going to be able to join us today. Uh, I know that she shared that she has some things going on in her family, uh, and unfortunately, uh, she's not going to be with us, but asked to uh, keep her energy and spirit in mind. And I'm going to actually toss it over to someone who is one of the most inspiring people I have met during this time during COVID, Spetzer Conover, to tell me what you think has excited you the most about what's happened to animal welfare during COVID? Inspiring. Thanks, Bobby. Appreciate that, man. I think one of the things that's been the biggest thing for us is our industry was so focused on animals. We were focused on the results, the save rates, the animals. And what COVID helped to do for us, especially locally, was, was to humanize the industry and to, to realize that there was a person on the other end of that animal, right? Whether they were having a hard time uh, with housing or whether they had a loved one die or they were sick and they didn't know if they were gonna get better. And for everyone on our team, our officers, our veterinary technicians, our animal care techs, we started to see the person more. And I think for us, that was, that was the biggest thing. And that's why I think our relationship with Haas has been so strong because that human aspect of it, human animal support. And, you know, if the dogs could talk, we'd be all out of business tomorrow, but they can't. And the reality is there's a human on the end, other end of every single one of them. And we need to know if we can help that. So for us, it's been, that's been the biggest thing for us. It's just the human aspect of all of this has really changed the way that we operate. Thanks, Spence. And I got about three DMs that basically say, where is Spencer from? So would you mind sharing? <laughs> I'm from I'm from Pasco County, Florida. I operate at Pasco County Animal Services, just north of Tampa. Awesome. Thanks, Spence. Kristen, we'll toss it back over to you. I'm not actually sure how to start this without Mary here. So I'm a little bit stuck. Um, she's been such a steady presence in these calls. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to share, we're going to cover a number of subjects today, and we want to be reaching out to you all to share on this call. So we're going to be kind of touching on about four things um, and have one presentation, but we want your, uh, we want you to weigh in. And so the things we're going to be covering today are, um, we're going to be touching back on the pet supply and demand issue. The last two weeks have felt really heavy, and I know we've walked away with some thoughts. So we're going to give folks just a few minutes to share um, the question of where do we go from here? We know that, that we have a pet supply and demand issue. We know we no longer have an overall overpopulation issue, but that some are, many areas of the country um, are still really dealing with oversupply. So we're going to turn to you for that. And then for those of you that have foster safety net programs, um, we're going to want to hear about those. So if you are doing any safety net services where you're providing housing for own pets, either at your organization or in foster, um, get queued up or invite your colleague who does that work on the call because we want to check in with those of you who are doing it. And we have a couple of poll questions. Um, so we're going to go to that a second. And then we're going to be talking um, with my Pitbullist family and Shannon Glenn and her team about the work they do and the overall issue of uh, providing services to pets and people and um, some of the triumphs and challenges of the last decade of their work. 
So um, let's go to, let's go ahead and start with our national organization partners who are on the call. So if any folks are on the call and want to make any announcements, we know there is lots going on. We're gearing up for a busy season. So uh, now just chime in. Kristen, I can jump in and I'm, I'm here on behalf of Jerica today, representing not only Pasco County, but the National Animal Care and Control Association, where I also sit on the board there. And as you know, more than anybody, we got some exciting things going on uh, with NACA. It is conference season. And like Bobby mentioned earlier, you know, COVID's been a, a pain in the butt for two years and we start finally starting to get back together, uh, which is really cool. NACA was able to attend the Carolinas Unite Conference and the Florida Animal Control Association Conference this past week. Great representation. We're doing a lot of really cool things. Um, and kind of leads me to my first update from NACA is NACA used to host a conference, a national conference every year, uh, somewhat represented somewhat attended, but we realized everybody couldn't attend. And so NACA did a really cool thing uh, this year and their conference committee voted to dedicate about $50,000 uh, to supporting state level conferences for animal control and state level animal control training. And so if you are in a, an area um, where you are a state, where you have a state association or you would like some additional support with a conference or training or continued education for your state, um, make sure to contact uh, NACA immediately. We have a lot of funding. We're already helping a number of different states. Great example. Um, it ranges anywhere from like with the FACA conference or Carolinas Unite. We have people attend and host a booth and give information. Someone like the state of Minnesota does not have a state association. And so we were contacted by their, I guess, leading body for animal control. Um, and they really just want us to host some trainings. And so we dedicated some funding to that. And so it can be anything in between. So if you're in a state and you're running animal control, or you know who's running animal control, get in contact with NACA because uh, we're dedicating some of those funds Two other big things from NACA too. One of our big um, focuses this past two years has been training. We want to focus on training, 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 training. We want to get uh, those updated with not only the latest training for animal control, but those position statements as well and position that NACA has been taking. So upcoming, some great cool things to announce from NACA. We're going to be, there's already an ACO1 and an ACO2 training. NACA is going to be introducing an ACO3 training pretty soon. And Jerrica was cool with me training, uh, sharing that. Uh, so I'm allowed to share it. Um, it's going to be focused on a high level animal control with uh, increased investigations like forensic investigations, cruelty. It's going to be in partnership with the University of Florida forensic medicine team. Really cool stuff. And then uh, last but not least, um, we uh, had some feedback um, from some members that said, hey, I'm a field training officer and I've never received training on how to be a field training officer. And so a lot of times in our organizations, the field training officer is just the guy or gal that's been there the longest, right? And so we were, NACA really wants to focus on getting those specific officers uh, training on how to train. And so NACA is putting together an actual field training officer certification course through their organization. And so I'm really excited about that. Training is going to be huge going forward. Conference support is going to be uh, huge going forward as well. So that's the update from the National Animal Care and Control Association. Thanks, Spencer. Hey guys, it's Kathy from Canada. Spencer, uh, tell Jerrica I'm coming looking for because all that training's in states, quote unquote. We have problems. She's, she's ready Canada. for you, Kathy. <laughs> Anyways, everyone, uh, I am here today, Kathy from Canada, not on behalf of Humane Canada, but on behalf of the One Health Integration Working Group to say, we finally have our toolkit. And I am dropping the link in the chat. So have a look at it. Send us any feedback. Uh, yeah, send that to Geraldine, actually. She may or may not be on the call, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much. And we'll see you all soon. Hey everyone, this is Jessica from Pet Finder. I just wanted to hop on really quickly. I'm frequently on the calls, rarely ever speak, but um, Pet Finder is restarting some of its educational series. So um, we put a hold on adoption options in 2019, I think we stopped. Um, we're coming back in 2022 with our first educational program about um, getting hard to place pets into homes more quickly. So if, if you are a Pet Finder member, you should have seen the invitation in our most recent newsletter. If you're not a member, I'd encourage you to become one and we can invite you to that webinar on March 24th. Thanks. Hi everybody, this is Valerie from the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement. And next Tuesday evening, we will be having um, a conversation with two folks from Humane Society International, uh, Dr. Catherine Pollock and Adam, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, Paris Candola. Um, and they're gonna be telling us um, 
basically what's going on in Ukraine that they've been helping with. And it should be a really interesting conversation. I'll put the link in the chat. So I hope you can join us. It will be recorded and then we'll post it. Hey everyone, it's Lindsay from the Humane Society of the United States. I just wanted to take a second to respond a little bit to the blog that was published last week by Nathan Winograd that talks a bit about a learning lab that we're that we've scheduled for Animal Care Expo next month. So I won't take too much time, but um, first I just wanted to thank those of you that reached out directly with questions either to me or to the panelists. I think that one of the best parts of these calls is that we've really created a culture of direct communication. So kudos to those of you that did that. And if you haven't seen the blog uh, and this doesn't make any sense to you, that's cool too. Uh, so just a quick history, Animal Care Expo, we've hosted in the past what we called breeder and panel and shelter panels because we wanted folks from our breeder advisory council to be able to connect with shelters in, in this uh, space. Uh, those who work closely with us, you know that uh, our work with responsible breeders is directly tied to our work to end puppy mills. And so in 2020, we had planned this learning lab um, as an extension of those conversations. We really wanted to give six hours to the conversation. Um, and of course, then the pandemic happened, so it's been bumped until this year. And just to come out and respond directly to the, the blog, um, there isn't any uh, description or intention to talk about shelters breeding dogs uh, directly. Uh, the conversation is very much about how we end puppy mills and how we do that by collaborating with breeders. Um, and I'll share our official response in the chat if folks need it, as well as my direct contact info if you have any additional questions. But i um, really excited to have a more in-depth conversation about this dog acquisition issue. And uh, thanks to those of you who reached out. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for sharing. If you are new to the call and this is your first time here, this is a leadership level call. Please introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're from. We're so excited when new folks join the calls. Um, so please chime in there. Um, so Lindsay gave us a perfect segue to talk a little bit about just a follow up from the pet supply and demand conversation. And the discussion around pet acquisition. And I want to put a link in the chat that is somewhat related to um, this issue, which is that for a lot of us talking about a shortage of animals or talking about partnering with breeders or not sterilizing animals, it can feel really strange um, because a lot of us are living in shelters or working in shelters where we're seeing the highest capacity for this time of year that we have seen um, in many years. Uh, so many colleagues are telling me that their shelters are completely at or above capacity, particularly for dogs. Um, and so, and this story came out in today, which is about sort of how we have this perfect storm of factors brewing. And my concern has been that we don't have that cushion of space that we usually have. So typically this time of year, we would have our shelters half full. Uh, and with cats, we'd have them almost totally empty so that when the high volume of intake starts to come in, uh, we have room for those animals. Right now, shelters do not have room for those animals. And so we're talking about this idea of pet regional pet shortages in the context of in the US facing a really challenging time. Um, and so the last two weeks were hard for me. I think they were hard for a lot of us to, to engage in that, but I really appreciate it and was so proud of how we were all able to talk about it and just wanted to give space to any of you who wanted to chime in about sort of where we go next with this conversation and how we keep it productively moving forward while addressing the really urgent need um, to get animals out of shelters and into homes. We know transport into shelters is down 17%. So we know that the system has slowed down and that's really putting way more animals at risk. So I'm going to ask that people just jump in and please keep your comments under one minute so we can hear from um, several people on this issue. And if you're not a person that likes to talk in front of several hundred other people, feel free to put those in the chat. But we really want to be the, the specific question is where do we go from here on thinking and talking about this issue? And this issue being the fact that 
some of us are completely inundated with animals. Um, we know lots of shelters are still euthanizing way too many animals, often for space. Um, and yet there is there are regional undersupply issues um, of pets. So um, go. I'd like to start out. This is Joyce Briggs for those that don't know me. I am one of the speakers at the Learning Lab that Lindsay mentioned. And I have been in animal welfare for about 25 years and I have been really focused on population management and trends and innovation in sterilization. I started off at, in the 90s when pediatric neutering was really new, getting that popularized, went on to high volume, high quality spay neuter, and now I've been working on getting us a spay shot, so ways to get access to that. But it's all been about going back to the beginnings and going back to the source. And so I think this new conversation is recognizing that the better the source of dogs, the better we can help them get really good beginnings that'll contribute to them not needing our care in shelters. So I would, I would love to channel what Mary, since Mary couldn't be with us today, she led off this conversation two weeks ago saying, consider that we have collaborators all around us. Consider that there are partners in this. And I think you'll find that people who care deeply about dogs, um, some of them are involved in trying to get happy, healthy dogs, um, get the best start in life and go into good homes. And they would like to collaborate with you on the goal of no, no euthanasia of dogs in shelters. So I guess I would just ask that we don't consider this an either or thing because absolutely, we need to focus on saving the dogs in shelters. And I, I do most of my work on cats, so I'm just talking dogs right at the moment because um, it's kind of different. But we, it's, I would just say, let's consider it's not either or, it's how do we do both? How do we get best beginnings? And how do we expand our circle of influence um, for dogs' beginnings? So that's that's the primary thing I wanted to. I am, I am um, with a new nonprofit called the Functional Dog Collaborative. And we have created specific position statements about um, our goals for people to adopt shelter dogs and also about shelters and breeding. And I'll put links to those in the chat too, because I'd like to acquaint you with this organization, which I think is going to be one you'll, you can be very excited about. Um, and also let you know how we stand on those key issues that are of such concern to, to both of us. Thanks Kristen. so much, Joyce. Hi, Kristen, this is Kay. We're doing a survey with the University of Oklahoma on transport out of state <clears throat> of dogs, a few cats. They have 60 shelters that are going to be in the study and they have visited with 15 of them to date. As soon as we have the raw data and it, you know we can share it with everybody, I will. Just as a uh, shot of what we're also looking at here in Oklahoma City area, the Oklahoma City Animal Shelter has been running consistently at 147%. So we really, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of tough. Thanks for that, Kay. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. I appreciate, um, I apologize, my camera's off. I'm actually, uh, I pulled over for this conversation. I'm in transit back to Austin from a shelter in San Angelo, Texas, um, and they need a, a lot of support. So if anyone's looking for a variety size of dogs and, and can take dogs with health certificates and, and vetting, uh, let me know. I will be happy to connect you. But I really appreciate the conversation over the last two sessions. And I can appreciate that the future of this supply and demand conversation surrounds uh, pet acquisition. I do feel, though, that we have a missed opportunity and we're skipping over um, an, an, another version of an advanced conversation, which is fixing some of the supply issues, supply chain issues that we have in front of us. Um, huge kudos to Best Friends for creating a national transport map, probably the first of its kind. But I think it says something that it's 2022 and it's the first time that we've had the ability to actually connect with each other. We don't have a great database to even um, be able to make connections. So, you know, we're in Austin trying really hard to create a transport hub where we're bringing in partners that don't have the ability to have access to a, a rabies vaccine or health certificate to transfer thousands of those animals and bring them into the national pipeline of support. 
but how can we collectively work together to fix the problem in front of us today? I think that's an advanced version of this conversation. Um, and I think agreed, it's not either or, but we should be doing both. And I would love more attention and piloting new initiatives on that. So happy to talk to anyone who's interested. Uh, and we also have a supply and demand working group through Haas that I would love to uh, recruit more people to so we can bring everyone's genius and brains together on this. So thanks so much. Thanks, Claire. And San Angelo is a shelter that needs a partner. Um, if anybody's interested, they have such an amazing variety. You would walk in that place and want to take home every single dog there. Um, and they really need a partner to work consistently with them. So if you're interested in that, please reach out uh, to Claire. They're a really one of those cool organizations who's not on anyone's radar. Hi, it's Ellen Jefferson. I'm sorry, I am on my phone and not on video, but um, I wanted to just follow up on what uh, Kristen said, and, um, and this sort of fits with what Claire's saying too, is that for the shelters that are really inundated with cats, especially, although I think this could apply to dogs, we know there's a seasonal wave to it. And so I would just implore everyone to seize the things that are within their control and really try to act upon them. And so that means doing tons of specials to get cats out now, um, free adoptions. Uh, we've got a Cats Gone Wild special going on in Austin right now for spring break. Um, it also means getting your volunteers, enlisting people, volunteers. You could even enlist um, other, other departments to call all foster homes that have had a cat for longer than 30 days and convince them to adopt them. I'm not suggesting that you twist their arm, but a lot of times if they're holding on to cats and not getting them adopted on their own, they may just want to adopt them. But everyone's goal should be to get their cat capacity down to, you know, 10 to 10% 10 of what you're going to need for the summer months so that you can be prepared for that tidal wave of kittens that happens, at least in Texas, it tends to happen in late April and early May. So that's my plug for taking, taking control of your situation and trying to make the best of it. Thanks, Dr. J. Um, for folks that are looking for uh, marketing support for your teams, I just dropped a link in the chat from a course from uh, Maddie's Fund about the fundamentals of marketing. It's a great course that's been created, should take your staff no more than an hour, and it might provide them some new tools and resources to help place some of those pets. And this is Julie Levy, and I had just a comment on this uh, impending wave of kittens. We've been looking at spay-neuter data nationally, and we are still behind across the country in the numbers of spays and neuters that are being performed compared to 2019. So we're still in a COVID slump for that. And the vet workforce is looks like it's, it's still in a tailspin. So that is going to be very hard for us. And the nationals could help us um, in some way increase that spay neuter capacity, especially for cats, uh, so that we don't have quite the, the tidal wave to deal with. And then just one thing that's been puzzling me about the, the supply and the demand issue is there is a parallel move right now with lobbyists for the commercial um, dog breeding industry, the large scale breeders and brokers and pet store chains to sort of rebrand their um, position as a, a crisis in dog acquisition. And so I'd like to hear from the folks that are working on this. Do you envision ever approving of kennel breeding of dogs where parents live in kennels? Um, or are you really envisioning that this is um, dogs raised underfoot in homes that we should be supporting. I think that is, that's where I have heartburn is imagining that there would be some sort of certification for large scale breeders and that parental dogs would be spending their lives in kennels. Joyce, I don't know if you want to quickly respond to that or if you want to have this talked about on another call. Either one is fine with me. I think it's a really important question, though, and um, would be helpful to understand more about that. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, I was in the chat <laughs> finishing writing something. Um, I can say that the, the group I am working with, the Functional Dog Collaborative, 
really feels like the ideal the ideal beginning for puppies is to be raised in a home and we would like to see dogs that are breeding be foremost successful family pets they deserve that and that's the best way to set up their puppies so what we are focusing on is how we can see more of that type of breeding start to meet the demand i think the challenge is right now the only way the systems figured out how to scale is through higher volume situations so i the work done by Purdue University and Canine Care Certified, I think is important because I don't think anytime soon these larger kennels are going to just shut down. So if there are ways to scientifically show that the welfare is can be very high for those dogs and the puppies can be well socialized, I think that needs to be figured out and done. That said, um, we are focusing on a very different segment, which is dogs that are raised in homes um, by families for families. I, th I think a lot of it would be more palatable on that second level. I think when we start talking about humane certification of large scale breeding and then distributing through brokers and pet stores, that's kind of it's a hard, it doesn't align with the idea of, of well socialized puppies and breeders meeting families and everything it's it's kind of and we have a bad track record of humane certification of animal agriculture in general you know anyway, I, I did I we'll talk about this at in expo too because i know it's a long conversation but i think the bundling of the conversation that includes essentially puppy mills and reforming puppy mills is um, creates a lot of skepticism about the whole idea and I, I'll, I'll just say that I think that, you know, I am have been raised within the animal welfare and sheltering community and I'm very committed to it. And I think that's what appeals to me about the things that, that we have learned about how to place animals in homes and how to mentor new families. There's a lot of that, those really good skills that there's not been a structure for for breeders to really do. And I shouldn't say that there's some really excellent breeders that stay in touch with all the puppies they've ever placed and whatnot, but at scale that doesn't exist. And that's why on a community level, I'm intrigued about how shelters may be able to collaborate and, and mentor to make sure puppies get the best start. Um, thank, thank you. Yeah, we should continue this. It is a longer conversation. So I wanna make sure we um, continue it when we have time. And I know Josh had unmuted. So I just wanna give him a second to say what he wanted to share. Thanks, Kristen. I was just going to say that, you know, I think there's valid points on all sides, right? But um, in animal welfare, we have previously seen uh, opening ourselves up to uh, giving opportunity to organizations that don't necessarily deserve it. And my fear with some of this is the potential to allow breeders or organizations that are breeding to apply for and get 501c3 certifications. And how we're going to do that in shelters and still kind of cover ourselves to prevent that from happening at a wider scale is a concern. Okay, great. We have time for two more brief, brief comments because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our speakers. So Allison, you have your hand up. You go ahead. Thanks, Kristen. I guess what I'm just reflecting on as I'm listening is you know, this is a national problem and just thinking about who's involved in the conversation and who isn't and that we're trying to solve a problem. And are we really asking the people who it's affecting? So people who adopt or buy puppies. And I just really wonder if we're just going to get stuck if we don't make this a more inclusive conversation. Um, and make it a safe conversation for people who have been traditionally excluded from animal welfare. Um, and especially just, you know, looking at, at the faces on this call. So I think it's something for us to consider. Thanks, Allison. And we have Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here in Des Moines, Iowa. I, I first want to recognize the courage of, of Brad and Matt to bring this conversation forward. I very much appreciate them as colleagues, have, have known and worked with them, and can imagine the anxiety that was there 
you know, just having this conversation. But when we start talking about puppy meals, having just went in and removed 541 dogs this past year from a large scale breeding operation and knowing how many of those puppy mills still exist in the Midwest and having seen that firsthand, you know, I, I just could not imagine a circumstance where that would be, you know, part of the conversation. I mean, you know, dogs should be in homes, whether they, they're being bred or not. And these large commercial operations are definitely there because there's the supply and demand issue. But the one that we dealt with and, and the ones that we do deal with are horrific places for dogs. I just needed to make that statement. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for all these comments. They're really all so important. And um, just to close this up for today, we're not ending this conversation. Um, someone very wise said that they think we need to maintain clear separation between the issue of um, shelter pet supply and demand and um, the issue of creating more humane breeding standards and more humane breeding practices. And I think there is some truth to that because we can't leave behind the dogs that are in shelters. Um, and so we're gonna focus um, as we get into spring and summer ha more heavily on um, supply and demand because just to reiterate, uh, transport is down 16 to 17% um, according to Pet Health and Steve Zeidman. It's looking at national data. Uh, that is a really critical issue. And to, uh, Allison's point um, that we need so many more voices in these all of these conversations. Um, and so we're going to make that a priority too as we enter spring and summer. And finally, um, Claire is working on partnering shelters up as sister shelters. We're just starting to pilot this idea, but there are so many shelters here in Texas. I know this is true for California and many parts of the South that have no line, no connection, and have like the most amazing assortment of animals almost all well socialized with other pets. So we're going to try to do some one on one connecting of um, shelters in the south with shelters that can routinely pull and develop a longer term relationship. There are resources to get those pets vetted and ready to go. So please do reach out to Claire. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk really quickly about foster safety net programs. I saw a couple people in the chat. Um, ask what, what that is. And it's really, it's fostering for pet pets that are owned by people, not pets that are unowned. Um, and this started really ramped up during COVID when people were getting sick uh, and were facing having to surrender their pet. And so there were foster programs. And so we have some poll questions. Um, so get ready if you are able to answer a poll question. We're gonna launch those now. And this is really setting up for conversations we're gonna have over the next couple of weeks. Um, so the first question is, do you currently provide, um, and this is, you can check all that apply, short-term boarding in the shelter for owned pets, short-term boarding at a private kennel for owned pets, facilitating foster care placement for owned pets, or something else? Um, so if you provide any of these services, please check them so we can see who's doing what. This is, I'll, I'll just add while we're waiting, this is a space that several funders have expressed their interest in supporting. So this data, and if you are chiming in in the chat that you really feel like you have a well-developed program, please let us know in the chat. Uh, we may reach out to you because there are several um, funding organizations that are interested in supporting this kind of program. Uh, so we really wanna know who is doing it. Just waiting for that poll result. Okay, it sounds like, wow, 56% of respondents um, said they are providing short-term boarding at the shelter. 25% uh, said they're providing short-term boarding at a private kennel for owned pets. And 65% said they're facilitating foster care placement for owned pets. That's amazing. Okay, we're gonna launch the second poll question. What is the maximum number of days you will provide boarding uh, or foster care for own pets? And we gave a, a range here. We may have missed the mark. It may be much longer, uh, but 
uh, from our understanding, most folks are somewhere between seven days and 60 days. So we're curious about, and this is just on average, we understand there are exceptions, but on average, how long are you willing to provide these services for people? And if you if you feel like also you have a well developed program and you're willing to talk with others who want to start one after this, if you could put your name or your uh, contact information in the chat or the contact information of the person that can help. This is a way we can easily help each other uh, get these programs started. So if you're willing to help, please let us know um, if you feel like you do have a really strong program. Okay, so it sounds like uh, the vast majority are offering boarding longer than 60 days if needed. That's incredible. 24% are seeing 31 to 60 days, 24% say 15 to 30, and 12% say 7 to 14 days. So it sounds like almost no one is offering fewer than two weeks. That's great to know. And one more poll question around this. Do you offer, wow, look at all the people volunteering to help others. That makes me so happy. That's amazing. Thank you, everybody reaching out and saying you'll help someone else. So if you want to start one of these programs, reach out to one of those folks. That's so cool. Okay, no cost temporary housing. So do you, um, this is a simpler question and, and probably one we could have asked at the beginning, but this is, do you offer or, or are you planning to offer? Would you like to offer any kind of no cost temporary housing for owned pets um, in order to prevent shelter surrender. So is this something that your organization is doing or wants to do? Um, and this is just a yes or no. We're curious how many of you are, are doing this or considering it. Okay, 74% said yes, that is amazing. Um, so good to hear. I think there's a lot of interest in supporting these programs. Um, so thank you. We are gonna move the sharing about your programs to probably next week because we're running, as usual, very short on time. Um, so we wanna make sure to give our speakers plenty of time. And I also think we'll probably run into the end of this call um, with our presenters. So I wanna give them plenty of time and we may do the second half of the discussion um, about what they're gonna talk about next time as well. But we wanna introduce our speakers today just by talking a little bit about what the situation with pet inclusive housing is because the reason that pit bull dogs are in shelters is primarily a housing and resource issue. And if you don't believe me, I took the HABRI study for you because it is very long and in depth and put it all into one, put all the data points into one page. So if you want to know the state of housing, it, it is all here in this Google Doc. Uh, welcome to review that. And I'm also going to post the link to the HABRI study. It is well worth reading. But what it really shows is that many people who want to own pets cannot. Um, if they could, they would be, if they were allowed to have pets where they live, they would be, um, but they're not adopting. And almost a fourth of people have had to move because of their pet. They've had, they've lost their housing and 14% of people have had to surrender a pet because of housing issues. So housing is at the heart of all of this, any conversation about pit bulls. And that's why my pit bull is family is such a critical organization to the movement. They've been doing this work for more than a decade. So I want to introduce Shannon and her colleagues are here. Um, Shannon, welcome and Metallica, welcome. And I forget who else is here, but welcome. I'm here. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Tiffany's gonna pull up our, our presentation here and get that shared if that's okay. Beautiful. All right. Um, so we are part of the leadership team at My Pitbull's Family. Um, Tiffany can go ahead and go to that next one. Beautiful. Um, my name is Shannon Glenn. I'm the executive director of My Pitbull's Family. You can see here with my two little fart machines, Wilbur and Charlotte, they're both snoring behind me. And of course, Max the cat isn't always the most photogenic or able to get professional photos, but he is the true top dog in our house. Um, he was, his mom was uh, 
a pregnant cat that was taken in by a pit bull rescue here in the Twin Cities. So he definitely thinks that he is a dog. Um, my email is there and I'm sure we'll drop those in the chat later on too if there's other questions. Um, I feel a little bit like um, Ariana Grande saying thank you next, but go ahead, Tiffany. Um, we just redid our mission, vision, and values statement um, as a team. And so we're really, really excited that this group of nearly 250 people are the first folks to really see this. Um, so our brand new revised mission is to keep families together by advancing dog inclusive rentals and insurance policies and providing essential pet retention programming. Our entire, you know, 11 years that we've been around now, is that right? Yeah, 11 years, um, has really been about keeping families together. Um, so we're, we're really, really excited to share all of this information with you. Um, go ahead, Tiffany, to the next one. Um, so how it all started. A little bit of background about us. So in 2011, a landlord here in Minneapolis um, realized that her two apartment buildings were really the only ones that accepted pit bull type dogs. Um, so from there, she started a bumper sticker campaign. So many of you on the call may have our bumper stickers or have seen them in your communities. Um, I wanna say that there's, oh gosh, it feels like close to a million bumper stickers across the US and across the world. Um, and so she started this bumper sticker campaign and really started having conversations around housing. Um, and then um, during that time, I was volunteering with wow. a pit bull specific um, rescue here in the Twin Cities wow. and really started to learn more about housing wow. discrimination. Um, Charlotte has a lot to say behind me, so she's really happy to be here too. Um, but Wilbur, my dog and I, we, we, um, <laughs> we're renting a, a house in Northeast Minneapolis and our landlord showed up and was like, you know, this dog isn't allowed here. What type of dog is he? All of those questions. And so it really opened my eyes to this, this type of, um, discrimination. And so you can see here in 2014, um, my early 20 something self um, became an executive director of my Pitbull's family. All we had was a bunch of 4XL t-shirts and a duct tape banner um, around a folding table and Wilbur there um, in his younger years too. Um, so we've really, really grown over the last um, 11 years as an organization. Uh, you can go to the next one, Tiffany. Um, so now we're doing around a hundred events Per year across um, the Twin Cities, um, so here in Minnesota, but also across the country, um, we are at pet expos, we're at all of the national conferences. Um, so if you're going to expo in April to enjoy some, some uh, warm weather in Orlando, we would love to see you at our booth. Um, Tiffany and I will also be presenting at the Best Friends Conference to talk more about our data in depth. Um, so we're always excited to attend events across the country and really share information about pet inclusive housing. Uh, you can go to the next one. <clears throat> so there are over 25 types of dogs that are commonly banned in rental pet policies. And I wanna do a little, um, ask you guys, um, ask all of you, what types of dogs do you think are commonly banned in rental pet policies? You can drop them in the chat. Yep, definitely chihuahuas, funny Kristen. Um, yep, seeing a lot of a lot of similar types. Perfect. Dogs in general. Yep. Um, all right, Tiffany, head over to that next one. Um, so throughout our research, we've found that over 25 types of dogs are commonly restricted in rental pet policies. So some might surprise you here on this list, um, but honestly, they're not really that surprising anymore as we know that um, you know, weight limits and size restrictions are also playing a role in this. Um, we've contacted landlords and they say that if a dog is more than five or 10% of a particular breed, they're going to be restricted. Um, and we know that landlords aren't um, visual experts in breed identification, nor are any of us. Um, and so we really want to raise this 
um, raise this issue to make sure that folks really know, um, you know, that the dogs that they love might be restricted um, in rental policies and of course in insurance policies too. Go ahead to the next one. Um, so all of this matters simply because as Americans, we love our pets. Um, we view them as members of our family. We know that folks are struggling to find homeowners insurance, but also rentals because of their pets. Um, like Kristen mentioned before we got started. And all of these, all of this information came from Best Friends Animal Society. So really thankful to have them as a partner um, in collecting this information. We also utilize our rental research, which um, Tiffany's gonna chat about here in a little bit. Um, for legislative efforts, we share all of our data um, with national organizations that are working on passing legislation in various states across the country. So we're always happy to share um, our data, but also you know, write letters of support, testify, um, where we most recently um, helped get a bill passed in Illinois around affordable housing. Um, and we're continuing to work on legislation in various other states, including here in Minnesota. Uh, we currently have nearly 300 community partner organizations. A lot of you are on this call, so thank you so much for signing up to be a community partner. Um, these organizations are rescues and shelters um, that really believe in you know keeping families together and making sure that we can have pet inclusive and dog inclusive housing and rentals um, across the country. Um, we also offer additional support. Um, so all of our partners um, will receive partner packs with various materials that they can use in their communities. Uh, we support shelters and other organizations with housing search projects. So if you um, go through our database that Tiffany's going to share, you'll see, you know, maybe there aren't a lot of rentals in your area in our database. We want to help you conduct those projects. So it's really great if you have volunteers that really want to volunteer from home um, or maybe just aren't able to come into the shelter right now due to COVID. We have volunteer opportunities for, for you and your team. Um, we also have our North Minneapolis Pet Resource Center. So we and I actually, we uh, work with a lot of organizations across the country to help them set up their pet pantries to answer questions of how we did it. Um, and we also, you know, really focus on building community partnerships um, here locally and, you know, across the country. One of the dreams that I have is being able to offer an apprenticeship where um, folks from organizations across the country can come up and spend time with us at our pet resource center learn how we've done things and, um, you know, hopefully take that back to their communities and realize that, you know, on a shoestring budget, you can really create a big difference in your community. All right, next one. Perfect, I'm gonna hand it over to Tiffany, our housing data specialist. Awesome, thanks Shannon. I'm excited to share with you all uh, our rental research efforts, as Shannon mentioned, and the type of data we collect and how we visualize that nationally. And so just a short introduction, I'm Tiffany Wu. I am the housing data specialist with My Pitbull's Family, and I am here in two years with the organization. So it's been an amazing time. As you can see here, I have one dog, Parker, who is an all-around good girl, really. Um, and we do do our fair share of fostering. So we have a foster pup right now. Um, and I think she's our 20th foster since the pandemic started. So that's been an amazing opportunity. Um, and same as Shannon, my email is down at the bottom. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any thoughts, questions, things like that that, are, that arise. So first I wanna talk about our organization's national rental research efforts. It's a huge initiative and under, undertaking by our housing team and amazing volunteers who really work towards more transparent pet policies across the nation. We're also working on expanding our team and bringing on a housing search support specialist who will work directly with families, provide resources, and share their stories, and also tailor our efforts in areas of need. As an organization, we've always had a housing database as our primary focus, but um, since joining the team, I brought into the, our process some amazing mapping software called ArcGIS to really put all of our data in one place and showcase our research in a really seamless way. 
So first we'll take a look at our rental research dashboard. This includes years of rental research work done by volunteers to better understand trends in pet policies and restrictions and continue building on research in areas we may be missing. So I'm just gonna hop off of this share, uh, presentation so I can share the dashboard with you all um, and sort of run through what that looks like. So it's an interactive application so that we can really understand the trends and the user can explore and understand um, trends in different locations. So you'll see as you zoom in around the map, the number of dog inclusive listings and restricted listings that we've collected over the years will, will show here um, with the ability to look more closely at different states and look at what that breakdown is um, and so forth. And so we also follow up with landlords um, uh, to send educational materials and thank you cards um, and really want to be more involved in advocating for those inclusive pet properties and pet policies and really thank rentals for being more inclusive and thoughtful um, in allowing different types of dogs and supporting families in that way. And so we primarily collect this information so that people in need of support and resources can know what to expect. But as Shannon has mentioned, we have also used this data in legislative efforts as well. And just some research findings we found is a pretty small percentage, around 7% of rental properties we research are truly pet inclusive. So having no breed restrictions and a higher limit or no limit for weight. And in recent months, we've started building on the data we collect to include more transparency in some of the financial barriers we see in pet ownership and housing. That is things like pet deposit, pet rent, pet fees, et cetera. And so some of the trends we see, we, we do see a wide range of different policies and costs, but a typical range is usually around $250 to $500 for a pet deposit. And there are instances where the addition of a second dog creates further barriers with sometimes even doubling that pet deposit. And we see a very similar range in pet fees as well. And so now I'll be demoing our housing database and what information we provide to families and communities. So similarly with this map here, um, these are all of our dog inclusive rental properties. And so someone could come in and type in a state, a zip code, uh, a city, and expand their reach if they like, um, and really get all of the information that we collect on a monthly basis, including pet policy, any restrictions, if any, um, and additional information uh, based on all of those things I mentioned earlier, such as pet limit, pet deposit, pet rent, and so forth as well. Um, and so again, an interactive map to be able to look around, place your cursor, expand, and really understand what the conditions are around where you live and the communities that um, are in need of support. And so with this, we're really excited to bring on that additional role um, to really directly connect with families and share success stories and impact. Finally, to round it out, I'd love to talk a little bit about, um, you know, being super excited for the next few years and expanding our reach with data um, with, you know, the resources that were provided and what some bigger goals that we'd love to have. So building our data team, first and foremost, can expand what we can do as an organization as a whole. Um, streamlining the data process would be amazing to be able to better integrate our data process with landlords, property management companies, and community partners we work with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ArcGIS licensing and software, we pretty much have the, the most basic sort of part licensing for nonprofit programs. So expanding the analysis and data tools that we have at hand would be um, a really great step for us. And finally, we are all really excited as well for potential partnerships, collaboration with other organiza organizations and businesses, especially those with technical expertise that could make our work even more impactful in this field. And I just wanna stop you, Tiffany, thank you so much. And I wanna do a shameless pr plug for them. Um, this organization needs funding and support to grow. Um, and for 10 years, they've shown that any investment in them is gonna result in a huge return. So uh, if any of you are 
on the call are uh, in that position to help, uh, please reach out to, to the team. Um, just wanted to do that and sorry, continue your presentation. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Tally to talk about our local impact at our Pet Resource Center. Hello, my name is Metallica, AKA Tally. Um, I'm the uh, North Minneapolis Pet Resource Center uh, Outreach Communications Coordinator. And as you can see, um, there's only three, do three dogs here, but um, there's Major, Boom, Daz, and Short Dog. Major's not pictured, but. Um, and then my email's at the bottom as well, if you'd like to reach out to me. Um, you can go ahead next, Tiffany. Um, so, um, to start things off, um, think about a time where you experienced a hardship. Um, so like what supports did you have in place? Did you know of any local resources or were resources easy to access or did you run into barriers? Um, if you could put those in the chat, if, it could be anything that you would be struggling with while experiencing a hardship. or not. <laughs> okay, I gave up my dog because I could not find resources. Yes, we do hear a lot of that. Yeah, no resources too. Okay, um, Tiffany, you can go ahead. So at North Minneapolis Pet Resources, we um, support our community through pets. Um, some of the people that come in, we do not ask for income requirements um, or residence income, I mean, residency requirements. Um, and then we have about 2,000 uh, plus visits per year. Um, all resources are fair game and we are community driven um, a program and then we offer pet clinics as well to the community so people can come and get their um, pets vaccinated and um, get the pet supplies that they need. Uh, you can go ahead, Tiffany. Um, so this is uh, January and February's totals um, for 2022. So overall, we've totaled um, uh, support, we supported about a thousand pets so far, and then we provided 15,900 pounds of food um, within with those two months. So we are supporting a lot of families and giving out a lot of food to our communities. Um, and it's, uh, I'd, I would say our uh, pet resource center is small, but it is a big vessel for our community. Um, a lot of people rely on us and, um, you know, I'm just thankful that we're able to provide for them. Um, you can go ahead, Tiffany. Um, so then we have 30 plus volunteers. Um, and then we do four community clinics um, uh, all year round. And then we serve uh, communities in 77 different zip codes across Minnesota and Wisconsin. So people will come from, you know, as far like in from Wisconsin, um, miles away just to get resource for their um, pets because there's no other resources that they can go to near their home. Um, and we don't turn anybody away. Um, we wanna make sure we support everybody that comes into the pet resource center um, to get food for their pets or supplies or even vouchers for spade or neutering. Um, so we wanna make sure we're open to everybody. Um, and then I don't know if there's a, another slide. Um, I don't know if Shannon, Shannon, did you want to speak on the orgs challenge? I think we should, we're almost out of time. So Shannon, I, I definitely want to have you come back next week. Cause I think the conversation you're about to open is a big one. So, uh, if you can maybe wrap up for today and we can kind of give a teaser for next week about what you want to talk about. Cause I think your topic is something a lot of folks are struggling with. Absolutely. Yeah. As you can see here from this list, you know, we definitely have challenges, um, and a lot of it comes from, you know, we don't intake animals, right? So for the last over a decade, we have been told that because we don't intake animals, we don't rescue or shelter animals, we're not worthy of grant funding. Um, and that's not to say we haven't received grants. We're very thankful and appreciative of organizations um, like the ASPCA who 
just gave us a large grant so we could hire our first staff person, which is me, and I'm so excited. This is the first time I've gotten to say it on a call. Um, but we've always been told that our programming is, isn't sustainable, and we've done this for over a decade. Um, and we just really know that this type of work is so critical and so important to the conversations that we're having. Um, so super excited to come back and really challenge funders and organizations to think differently about how we're funding um, community-based resources without being attached to a shelter. That's a perfect conclusion for today, a perfect intro to next week. And you guys are so awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, just to think about that you've done this work with a very, very shoestring funding for a decade now. It's just incredible. So thanks for being here. Um, thank you so much to Tiffany and Metallica as well. And we'll see you all. We hope we can get you back here next week to continue the conversation. Today was uh, great. Thanks to all of you participating. We really appreciate you being here. We hope you have a great weekend and we will see you again next week.